this morning I want to talk about Christ's last appeal. As the final days for Jesus came, the discussions became more and more intense with the Jewish leaders and the people. Some of these discussions are recorded for us in Matthew chapter 21, 22, and 23, those three chapters. Those are Christ's final conversations with the Jewish nation before he goes to the cross. In fact, there's about a week between here and the crucifixion. And uh, all these people were brought ultimately to the point of decision. Decisions are made because of discussions, right? There are people discussing these things all across this valley, clear down into Douglas and Alfreda, and uh, hearing this message for the first time. Discussions bring decisions. And it was decision time for the Jewish nation. All this is a type of the, or an example, I should say, of the close of human probation. For the Jewish nation, it was absolutely critical. On issues so important, there could be no fence sitters, just as there can't be fence, fence sitters today, right? And uh, here are some samples. I'd like to invite you to turn with me and follow along in Matthew chapter 21. The first of these three chapters that are so important, so important to the Jewish nation. Matthew chapter 21. I want to read verses 15 to 17. And it says, And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore, what does it say? Displeased, sore displeased. And said to him, Hear you what these say? And Jesus says to them, Yea, have you not read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfect praise. Isn't that neat? And uh, drop down to verse 23 to 27. 23 to 27. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you, do you these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing. Which of you tell me? I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where it was, from heaven or of men. And they reasoned with themselves saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say to us, why did you not then believe him? But if we say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said to them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. <clears throat> wow. Then Jesus told, tells two well-known parables, parables that we're all familiar with about the vineyards. <clears throat> Notice Christ's comments. 21, let's drop down to verse 42 to 46. And Jesus says to them, did you never read the scriptures? The stone with the, which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. And this is the Lord's doing. It is a marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I to you, the kingdom of God shall be what? Taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. The kingdom, what's taken from them? The kingdom. <clears throat> they had a special privilege. They were the children of Abraham, right? And the promises of Abraham were theirs. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham was promised the world. This was the kingdom. He was going to set up his kingdom. Verse 44, Whosoever shall fall off this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard these parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. <clears throat> Interesting things. And when, they get, and when we get to chapter 22, the conversations even become more intense. And the people are taking it all in as Jesus dialogues with these leaders. What a forum. Here are the leaders. Jesus is talking to them, and all the multitude are gathered around and listening in. Discussions, 
lead to decisions. And uh, right in the very shadow of the cross, this was taking place. And the hope of Jesus is that they'll understand the importance of the time that they're living in. You know, this is something we need to do too. Are we living in important times or what? You know, um, I, I look at the news, I'm looking at it less and less now. <laughs> I used to sit there and listen to it quite a long time, but I'm listening less and less. It's a fearsome time that we're living in. History says that they all turned against him. Even the disciples forsook him and fled as the time came. It would be very easy of us for us to say, oh, I wouldn't have gone down that road like they did. Have you ever thought that? Would I do that? Why didn't they get it? You know, I'm not so sure that we would make a different decision if, if we were in that same situation. The one who was indeed the very gospel. You know, in the writings it says that Jesus is the gospel. Hanging on the Christ, cross, Christ is the gospel. The one who indeed was the gospel, personified, the creator of the universe, was talking to them. He'd been living with them for 35 years, 33 years, and they knew very much about what he was doing. He was the homeless miracle worker. Did you hear me? Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. They had heard genuine truth. They had seen genuine miracles. And when we learn a truth, what are we supposed to do with it? Wrap your arms around it. Stick with it. Because they received not a love of the truth. They were taught, they were, they were destined to believe what? A lie. And you can read about that in 2 Thessalonians 2. Because they received not a love of the truth. And for this cause, God shall bring strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So when we learn a truth, we want to be right, right in the middle of, that, middle of that truth. Rebellion is, is the sin of witchcraft, and this is what was happening in Jerusalem that day. Rebellion is very deceptive. You know, it's easy to justify rebellion. They were convinced that they were right in turning against Jesus. The leaders couldn't be wrong, could they? Could the leaders be wrong? Could the pastor be wrong? I don't want anybody here to take my word for this. Study the scriptures and see if these things be so. Then the parables in Matthew 22, beginning with the parable of the wedding garment. You all know about that one. The man was in the wedding and didn't have a wedding garment on. He walked right past the people in the foyer who were giving out the wedding garments. And they walked right into the wedding, an act of rebellion. Do you know that over half of the parables of Jesus are about the judgment, the investigative judgment, the time in which we now live? Jesus knew all about that. And here we are this morning in that very situation. It was judgment day in Jerusalem. And the lesson for us is that we live in the hour of God's what? Judgment. Important things lie ahead. And in that day, let's look now at Matthew 22. Let's look, look at verses 15 to 17. 22 verses 15 to 17. It says, And then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might ent entangle him in his talk. And they sent out to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that you are true and true. And teach, your, and teach the way of God in truth, neither care you for any man, but you regard not the person of men. There, tell us, therefore, what think you? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Heavy, heavy was hanging on their heads, and they were talking about trivial things. They came back later the same day, all kinds of controversies in the next verses. I would encourage you, this would be a great Sabbath afternoon read because it's talking about us. It was judgment day in Jerusalem and we live in the hour of God's judgment. Things are not going to always be like they've always been. Controversies that took place that day only muddied the water. Controversies they didn't need to be a part of. 
deep answering to deep. Jesus was talking. Deep answers to deep. The thundering, thundering crash of waves reaches clear to the depths and riptides. We're not talking about swaddle of the froth of a tide pool here. Jesus is it's judgment day for the Jew, Jewish nation. And Jesus is the one who is giving them some things that they could think about and make decisions on. Things that were important considering the things that just lay ahead. For example, verse 24, chapter 22, verse 24, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his, brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed to his brother. Now, things that didn't make any difference. These were, you know, we can get in controversies in the church setting too, can't we? Things that don't make any difference. Things that divide us. Uh, we also need to be careful that we don't get off track. They were trying their best to trip Jesus up, and when in reality, there were more, much more weighty things they should be considering. These people were in the very shadow of the cross. The devil loves to stir up controversy in families, in churches, in schools, in conferences, right? Take our eyes off the mission, that's what happens. So the devil can keep people from pondering important issues, important issues. The clear ideas from scripture. Why does Satan major in controversies? Why does he do that? Again, the bottom line is that con controversies destroy the mission. If no mission, I guess we could ask this ourselves the question, if no mission, why are we here? This is not a social club, is it? We have a mission. So as Jesus is talking, he is careful here. Destinies, destinies are involved. He came to seek and save them who are lost. That was his mission. Then notice chapter 22, verse 46. It says, and no man was able to answer him a word. Neither dared any man from that day forth to ask him any more questions. This was the last. Chapter 23 also has some more, but this was the last. The last discussions. Chapter 23 comes next. Jesus teaches. He spends time talking to the multitude that had gathered. He tells it like it really is. He wants to influence them. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. So he contrasts between his mission and the selfish goals of the leaders. He contrasts between the mission and the selfish goals of the leaders. He tells about blind guides and hypocrites. If you want to read some real strong language, this is in chapter 3, as he nears near the end of that chapter. And then his final appeal and I just love to read these words because it tells about the love of our God. Chapter 23 and verses 37 and 38. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings and you would not. For I say to you, oh, behold, your house is left to you, what does it say? Desolate. That's a strong word. For I say to you, you shall not see me hereafter till you shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That took place a short time after that. And uh, that was the week of the crucifixion. So this was the close of probation for the Jewish nation. Close of probation is a very important idea. Thankfully, many came to their senses uh, when it came the day of Pentecost. It says in Acts uh, chapter 6, I believe it is, that many of the priests and leaders um, decided for Jesus after they saw the things that happened that weekend. But unbelief is such a terrible thing, you know. If, if forever separated, it forever separated the Jews from God as a nation, as a nation. I want to make sure I say it that right. He doesn't reject Jews. 
They're on an individual footing like all the rest of us, right? They can be grafted in just as the Jews were grafted in that olive tree. <clears throat> all this goings on is in the setting of the stunning and wonderful prophecy that we have in Matthew 24 and 25. Now, we read 20 parts of 21, 22, and 23, those final conversations. Then we have those beautiful chapters, chapters 24 and 25. Wonderful prophecies. Very next chapter. This is the great prophecy of the Gospels. This is the crown jewel. Christ's own prophecy as he stands in the very shadow of the cross. Notice with me Matthew 24, verses 1 to 3. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Even the disciples were proud of that beautiful temple. Herod had remodeled it. This was the temple that was built after the Babylonian captivity. And then, uh, as we come down near the time of Christ, why Herod rebuilt that temple. He remodeled it. It was a beautiful temple. The disciples were proud of it. Verse 2, And Jesus said to them, See you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be one stone, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be overthrown. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Their reasoning, if the temple, which is so wonderful and beautiful, if not one stone is going to be left on another, surely that must be the end of the world. That's what's going through their minds. Events of our day are foretold here in Matthew 24 by Jesus from the mount overlooking Jerusalem. And the conditions we face today are clearly revealed here. There's comfort here for all those who labor in a time of great perplexity. Anybody here living in a, under a cloud of great perplexity? I, know, I don't need a show of hands. I know that we all have those times, right? But the world is in a state of great perplexity right now. We're living in that kind of a time. If it fits your description, Matthew 24 and 25 are for you. These chapters are salvific. And Jesus here promises deliverance soon to come. The disciples here call Christ's attention to the wonderful masonry of the temple. See what manner of stones they, these be, they declared. Josephus, who was the Jewish historian, says that these magnificent foundation stones, some of them were 70 feet long. It was a feat of, that. well, you know, it, how they got there is an engineering feat for that time. It wouldn't be today. We have things to do that with. 70 foot long slabs of marble. Can you imagine that? Jesus answers, not one of these stones will be left upon another. And the disciples want to know about the timing of this destruction. What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And if all this is going to happen, it must be the end of the world. What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? Matthew 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, very first words out of his mouth, take heed that no man, what does it say? Deceive you. We're in a time of great deception right now. People are being deceived. And uh, we need to be careful even for our, own, for our own understanding of things. The greatest times of great deception are yet ahead for the disciples. And Jesus knew what it would be like at the, time, at the very end. So he inspired John to write about our day as well. Time of great deception. I'd like to invite you to turn, to turn with me to Revelation chapter 13. There's going to be a great revival. Watch for it. It's going to be a false revival, and it's going to precede the true one. We often talk about the latter rain. It's going to be a great revival among God's people, right? When the latter rain falls, but the false will precede the true. Notice verses uh, 13 and 14. Revelation 13, 13 and 14. And he doeth great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Fire from heaven? What happens when fire comes down from heaven? It's revival time, right? 
Fire represents the Holy Spirit. There's going to be a false revival of spiritualism will be behind it. The devil behind this revival. And notice what it says a little further. Verse uh, 14, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Also notice Matthew 24, 24. Matthew 24, 24. And here's what it says. Matthew chapter 24, verse 20. I'm in, I'm in 20, chapter 25 here. Sorry about that. Matthew 24, verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch as if it were very possible they should deceive the very elect. I want to tell you that the false prophets and the false the deceptions that are going on in the world today are as plentiful as the frogs of Egypt. They're all around us. And uh, the disciples want to know about the timing of all of this. In Matthew 24, Jesus mingles the tragic events that preceded the fall of Jerusalem. He mingles that with the events surrounding the coming of Jesus in power and glory. Often in these writings, it's difficult to distinguish in some areas where Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming. He intermingles them so well. That's why some history is probably pretty important for us. Jesus gave signs of both. He talks about wars and pestilence and famine and earthquake. He talks about the gospel to all the world. Did the gospel go to all the world in the first century? Indeed it did. Paul says it went to every creature under heaven. By 60 AD, he could write that. That's in Colossians 1 verse 27. Those who lived in that generation when Jerusalem was destroyed, indeed saw all of these things that we've been talking about here. That generation would not pass until all these things be fulfilled, including the gospel to all the world, which Paul said was accomplished. I said uh, Colossians 1.27. It's Colossians 1.23. I see some of you are taking notes. It's Colossians 1 verse 23. Paul said the gospel had gone to every, nation, every creature under heaven, all around the Mediterranean rim, on into Europe, westward and northward, and eastward over into India even, and south into Africa and Egypt. The gospel went in that century. And uh, they saw a time of tragic warfare, political tumult, they saw Christian martyrs, even signs in the heavens in that first century. And we can learn a lot from what happened in that first century. The first century saw a marvelous working in the lives of the missionaries in the cruel face of opposition and the dangers. They didn't have television and internet and radio just shoe leather and a lot of physical exertion carrying the gospel everywhere. And zeal for Christ. What a zeal they had. I remember reading about Paul. He leaves, they, they take him out of the town and they stone him. They think he's dead. Paul lays there like he's dead. Playing a possum, I guess. As soon as they're gone, he doesn't hear voices anymore. He gets up and he goes to the next village and preaches the same thing again. That's how he did that's how those first centuries, you know, they were, they were all martyrs. All the apostles were martyrs, except for John. And John, in principle, did. They threw him into a pot of boiling oil, and, and then they had to fish him out. He's like the three Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace. In our day, the same world conditions exist as existed in the first century, only a more intense and more on a global scale as we approach the advent. And yet, to an even greater extent, the gospel will go to the world than it did in the first century. It is to go into the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. True to Christ's prophecies and warnings in the final conversations with the leaders in Matthew 21, 22, 23, and 24, the city that had cast away God's protection in rejecting their Messiah, they were compassed about by Roman armies. Terrible political upheaval was taking place. 
Daniel predicted it would soon, it would come, that that, that that destruction of Jerusalem would come soon after the crucifixion. If we could turn to Daniel 9, verse 26. This is one of the most mis misunderstood passages in all the Bible. It's in Daniel 9, verse 26. Let's take a little look at that. Two princes are mentioned here. We won't take a lot of time to discuss that, but, but Daniel predicted that soon after the crucifixion, the city of Jerusalem would be leveled. Jesus talked about that. Let's look here at chapter 9 and verse 26. After three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. But not for himself. Who was he cut off for? The whole world of sinners, right? Sixty centuries of earth people he was cut off. Not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. Now, this passage talks about Messiah the prince. That's one of those princes, right? We know who that is. And who is the prince that should come and destroy the city and the sanctuary? This is the Roman general, right? Two princes are mentioned here in this passage. In the end there shall, thereof shall be a flood, with a flood, and to the end the war of desolations are determined. This is in Daniel's 70th week. And that prince was a Roman general in 70 AD. And when the Roman general came, the city was leveled. And true to Christ's prophecy, uh, not one stone was left on another. Now Josephus, I'll talk about Josephus here in a minute. He says that there were some things still left, but nothing of importance. So uh, the first siege of Jerusalem came in 66 AD. What year? 66 A.D. under a Roman general by the name of Cestius. Now you can read about this in history books. Uh, Ellen G. White has uh, comments about this in uh, Great Controversy. He put siege lines around the city, even attacking the outer buildings of the temple. He got that far with it. The standards of pagan Rome were an abomination to the Jews, and they were planted all around the holy places that had been graced by the very physical presence of Jesus some 40 years before. It was this, it was this very sign that Jesus spoke of. Now, Matthew 24, 15 to 20, let's look at that. <clears throat> this is important for us because we're repeating history. The events that happened around Jerusalem just before 70 AD are things that we're gonna see again. Matthew 24, 15 to 20. Matthew 24, 15 to 20. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand. Then let him which is in Judea flee to the, unto the mountains, and let him which is in the house not, not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe, be, woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in the winter nor on the what? Sabbath day, okay? How can Christians in a locked down city ever get out? How can they flee? But Christ's message foretold that there would be a way of escape, just like he did for us, right? It's going to seem very impossible in the days ahead. They were not to waste any time, and history tells us it was, as Cestus was attempting to undermine the very temple walls. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that Cestius changed his mind suddenly and unexpectedly. He says that he returned from the city without reason, in, without, without a reason in the world. Josephus said that. He left without a reason in the world to leave. He had siege lines all around the city and he was attacking the outer perimeter already. There it was, the moment of escape by the believing, praying, preparing Christians, the watching Christians, the ones who believed Jesus, Christians who still lived in Jerusalem, as the Roman armies withdrew, the gates of the city were opened and the Jewish armed forces walked through those gates. 
They rushed through the gates. They ran after the, the Roman soldiers who were leaving the city, and they killed, they murdered a whole bunch of them. It's kind of like uh, taking a sharp stick and poking a grizzly bear, right? They were attacking the Roman armies. It was a Roman empire in those days. They went out in hot pursuit for the, for the Romans. They killed many, many soldiers. But at that moment, at that moment, Christians saw the open gates, and they fled through those open gates. They had only a short period of time to get out. They didn't have time to go get their refrigerator or whatever. <laughs> no one there to stop them. Two centuries later, a man by the name of Eusebius in his ecclesiastical history book wrote, the whole body of the church, as Jerusalem having been commanded by divine revelation given to men of approved piety there before the war, it's hard to read, removed from the city and dwelt in a certain town beyond the Jordan called Pella. <laughs> this is a, a translation. It's hard to read. The words don't come real clear. In effect, it's simply saying, when the, when the opportune time came, those believing Christians left that city and they left it immediately and went to a, across the Jordan to a town called Pilla. Pilla. This, is, this is the importance of the signs given by Jesus to them and to us as well. The believers were ready. They believed and they escaped and the spirit of prophecy says that not one lost their life. It was only, it was their only chance. We ought to praise God for that, shouldn't we? These are Christians. We're going to be in heaven with those people one of these days. I'd like to ask them what that was like. When the Jewish forces quickly returned from the pursuing the Romans, they closed the city gates. At once the Jewish soldiers began preparation to resist the siege the next siege which they knew was coming. So they barricaded the gates. There's no way they could get out after that. It just happens that it was over three years later that, that uh, the real problem came. They had plenty of time, probably. Those Jewish zealots, uh, those soldiers among the Jews, instituted a reign of terror, and none could go, out of, go into or out of Jerusalem. And if Christians had been attempted to go out some way or other, uh, they would have been cut down without mercy. So God made a glorious provision for those people. The sign Jesus gave was that when the abomination that was desolate would stand in the holy place, they should flee. And three and a half years later, the Roman armies returned led by Titus. He drew the lines of another siege around that city until the city fell. I'd like to have you turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 43 and 44. Luke 19, 33 and 34. I'm sorry, it's 43 and 44. For those days shall come upon you that your enemies shall cast a trench round about you and come pass, round about, round, uh, con con pass you around and keep you on every side and, they sh and shall lay you even with the ground. What does that mean? They shall lay you even with the ground and your children with you and they shall not leave, and, and they shall not leave in you one stone upon another because you know not the time of your visitation. Christ had said Jerusalem's massive walls would be leveled. Now it's interesting that Josephus, in talking about this when Titus came and destroyed the city, he said that the Romans did leave a small section of the wall. And um, he left some of the highest towers standing as memorials. But as for the rest, he asserts, it was thoroughly laid even to the ground, just as Luke, like Luke said, in almost the language of Luke. Now, um, I don't think jo Josephus uh, was really a believer, but Josephus was familiar with the language of Luke. What a marvelous deliverance. Does it bring you comforts to know that God is in charge 
and that he makes provision for his people in time of tr trouble and stress. Tr trouble is, is gathering over the world. The storm clouds are already gathering. We can watch them as, every day. And uh, the instruction again in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached where? To all the world for a witness to all nations. And then what does it say? And then it talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And when you see him standing in holy places, what do you do? You realize that that, that time has come. That's in Matthew 24, 14, and 15. The abomination that makes desolate, or some have called it the, the abominable sacrilege, is coming again. And it will be again the center place of rebellion against God. When the invoking of a law requiring the observance of a false Sabbath is, is invoked, it's time to follow the instructions of Jesus again to the letter. It's time to receive his seal when that time comes. I know that I used to live in the, in the uh, Southern California area. Uh, at that time, that was back in the 60s when I lived there, there was a lot of Adventist people living under the cloud of smog. smog. Some of you lived there during that time. At that time, there were 25,000 Adventists living in that city and the environs of Los Angeles. 25,000 of them. And I heard people at church say, we gotta get out of here, time to leave. Time to go move out of, out of the great cities. The instruction has been given to us. The instruction is that when you see the omens of these Sunday laws beginning to come, it's time to leave the cities. I'm kinda glad I live here, aren't, don't you? <laughs> I praise God every, every day that I live out here in the country and you know, but. Uh, but this time is coming, and some people will have to stay in the city. Some people have work to do down there. But just to live down there is not a good thing. And uh, so uh, one of these days, there will be Sunday laws. Sunday laws are coming. And then the end will come. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, the abomination is coming just as surely as it did in 66 AD and 70 AD, when Cestius sieged Jerusalem and put his flags in God's holy places. At last it will come right through the church and no one will be immune. I want to read to you, we're get winding down here. We'll be done by a quarter after, I hope. In Daniel, Daniel 11th chapter. How many of you have studied Daniel 11 very much? Can I see your hands? Daniel 11 is an important chapter to us. Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 41. By the way, we're studying Daniel in prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. We're taking it pretty much verse by verse. By and by, we'll get to chapter 11. The events of chapter 11 are almost fulfilled. But in uh, verse 41 of chapter 11 of Daniel, these are important um, messages from Jesus, like he did in Matthew 24, giving us some specifics. It says, he shall enter in, this is verse 41. He shall enter also into the, what does it say? Glorious. The glorious land. What is the glorious land? God's church, right? He's going to enter into the glorious land. Now, somebody asked me one day, how can that be the glorious land? <laughs> how can the church be the glorious land? Is it anywhere mentioned in the Bible that the land is, is uh, refers to a church? Malachi, if you could just page over to Malachi chapter 3 and verse, uh, I believe it's verse 12. It says, and all nations shall call you blessed and you shall be a delight, delights, delightsome, what does it say? Land. You know, we were talking about that in some of the classes we were with, and as Coral is the one that pointed this out to me. <laughs> Saw this for the first time. The church is called a land, right? In, in Daniel 11, it's called the glorious what? And the he here is the king of the north. He shall enter into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown. Countries is a supplied word here. It's italicized in your Bible. And these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and chief of the children of Ammon. I'm not going to take the time to talk about those three. 
We'll talk about that in prayer meeting. But uh, anyway, uh, the glorious land here is the church. This will be Satan's last stand against God's people. Our time of escape will come shortly thereafter. Revelation 12, verse 1 says, At that time shall what? Michael stand up, the great prince. There's the prince again. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there will be a time of trouble, such as never was. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name is found where? Written in the book. Make sure your name is written in the book. I would urge you to read Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, where it talks about the Sardis church. Uh, he said, when the judgment comes, I'm going to confess you before the Father. And if you're an overcomer, your name will not be blotted out of the book. That's judgment, isn't it? Judgment. So our time of escape comes shortly after Daniel 12, 1. At that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone whose name is found written in the book. Who will have faith to stand in that day? Jesus asked that question one time. He said, when I come, will I find faith in the earth? Great question. In Revelation 6, 14 to 17, there's an interesting question asked, who will be able to stand in that day? That's chapter, the last verse of chapter 6 of Revelation. And the next chapter, it says who they are. Who are they? They're the sealed ones. God is getting ready to seal his people. There's a trouble, time of trouble coming. And um, yes, who will be able to stand? Who will have faith? In these same, it's the same deliverance as when the Christians fled Jerusalem at the right moment. Our deliverance will also come from the east. It says, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having what? The seal of the living God. The salvation for those Jews who fled Jerusalem was east across the Jordan at Pella. Our deliverance will also come from the east. The Jordan River where they, where they were safe. The abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet is mentioned several times in Daniel. And the implications are that it's important for us to have a knowledge of these prophecies. Jesus came to his own, and what happened? His own received him not. How come? They had the same prophecies that, that, uh, that would have given them the exact time when Jesus would show up on the earth, when he would be baptized in the River Jordan, when he would die on the cross. All these were privy to them. Wow. Leaders again, right? Got to be careful about all these things. They contain the warnings of Jesus and the promises of Jesus. The people of God, are they so firmly established upon the word of God that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? So we're living in the seedling time of earth's history. Soon the mark of the beast will be urged upon us. It's placed in the forehead, which signifies that it involves Decision-making. Discussions lead to decision. Jesus hoped that day that these discussions would lead to decisions that would, that would be positive for them. Some of them remember those discussions. Later on, after the Pentecost, they, they became believers. To resist or, re or reject the seal of God is as lethal to our eternal life as not following the instructions to leave Jerusalem. The seal will be a pathway of our, our escape from this world to the next one. To receive the seal is to invite the Holy Spirit to clothe you with the robe of Christ's righteousness. Give your heart to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. Pray that the Holy Spirit will be in your life through that day to help you make important decisions that you need to make. He will speak to your heart. In studying the prophecies, we are learning of God's ways so that when the prophecies come to pass, we'll know what to do with it. This very day, we can have the assurance of salvation. Justification by faith is the work of a moment. How long does it take to give your heart to God in a meaningful way and to do that every morning and every moment of every day? Certainly the times demand this, 
in this little congregation, none of us, you know, we need to all be there. We need to all be there. And then grow into Christ every day, allowing the word to nourish and enrich you. And God will give you strong, strong uh, decision making. Don't let Matthew 21, 22, 23 happen to us. Grow as you study and pray for God's will in your life. So let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for your great love. Your love encircles the whole world. And we're so thankful, Lord, that we could be a little part, that you've looked at us and, and you have found some possibilities that we can be your children. What a privilege, a high privilege to be a child of the King. And so I pray, Lord, that you'll be with each one here today. Deepen our conviction, Lord. Help us to give ourselves to you in such a way that, that you would never, never pass us by. I pray that you be with everyone today just according to our several needs. And I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.